Okay, this is the part of the podcast where I make uh, my guests sit here very uncomfortably and be quiet for about 30 seconds. Um, esteemed guest and a friend, Larry Wysoon. If I had to list, I tried to list, just right now, I tried to list this on my uh, notepad here, the top 10 deer and deer hunting all-stars of all time, going back to 1977. I came up with nine so far, and um, uh, Larry can help me out here. I came up with Leonard Lee Rue, Dr. Val Geist, Charlie Alzheimer, John Ozoga, Bob Zaglin, Dr. Steve Ditchkoff, Keith McCaffrey, and my guest, Larry Wysoon. Larry, welcome to Deer Talk Now. Well, thank you very much. I'm truly honored. It's been a while, my friend. It's been such a long time. When I started as a pup in this industry, you were a field editor for Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine. Yes, I was. I was there with Charlie Alzheimer and, of course, Patrick D Darkin was our editor at the time. Richard Smith was up north. And we even had a couple other guys on staff at that time as well, too. My goodness. It's been, and I was uh, reliving some history here after we talked last week. I was all excited. Going to get to see Larry again. We're going to have him on the podcast. And I was going through some of those articles. And the thing that really stuck out, if, if you don't know, well, my goodness, I've got a list here of the things Larry has done in his life. But um, you probably know him from TV. You probably know him from podcasts. If you're, um, you know, listening to this podcast, obviously, but his forte was writing, and you wrote over four thousand magazine articles in your life, didn't you? I did. I did. I used to write almost two hundred a year, which kept me pretty darn busy. I'd go to a hunting camp, and everybody else would go to go to sleep, and I'd go get my back then. To start with, I get tickled because every once in a while someone says, Larry, when you got started, what would you work on? And I said, a, a big red chief tablet. And they go, they had tablets back when you started writing? And I go, yep. They still make them. <laughs> they still make them. <laughs> I just ripped a page out of mine with my notes here on it. I remember that. Wasn't that like the benchmark? Well, the benchmark was like 100 articles a year, right? Then you really knew right. you were doing something. Yep. Yeah, there, but there were, I mean, there were so many years there that I wrote a lot. I wrote for a lot of different publications and, and for a while too, I, I wrote under several different names as well too. And, and, uh, that's really kind of how I got started when I worked for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department years ago as a wildlife biologist to start with, they did not want us writing for any publications uh, other than maybe the state thing. So when I got started writing, I started writing under all kinds of different names and, and uh, telling all kinds of different stories, but a lot of them were related to the wildlife background that I had, particularly in terms of white-tailed deer. And I was one of those guys that came along very fortunately at the right time when it had to do anything with white-tailed deer. Back when Al Brothers and Murphy Ray first wrote a book called Producing Quality Whitetail, and back when Jerry Smith, who we mentioned, Lenny Lee LaRue, yep. Lenny was a fabulous photographer, great friend, and most of the deer that he had opportunity to take pictures of were yearlings and two-year-olds, because that's all that they had in that area. When Jerry started photographing mature deer down on the King Ranch, and about the same time, John Wooders, who was also from Texas, as was Jerry, started writing about hunting mature white-tailed deer. And that was my time of coming on board as a, as a hunter, as a wildlife biologist, and, and as a writer as well, too. You hit it at, like, the time. That was, I did. It, that it was perfect. the perfect time. Yes, it truly, truly was. I mean, white-tailed deer was really kind of in its infancy. We A lot of people hunted deer, but that was about the time we saw some changes in attitudes about deer and, and deer hunting, of course, as well, too. You know, I had you just mentioned a name I'd have to put. I just thought of three names, uh, Al Brothers, and then I thought of Carl Miller and Joe Hamilton. I'd have to put those guys on there as well. Uh, Al Brothers was from texas and that's where the whole idea from quality deer management came from now this dates back into the 70s right exactly if i recall correctly uh, al and murphy ray who was a biologist for the texas parks and wildlife department and who i replaced as the technical assistance biologist in south texas uh al was really kind of the innovator in a lot of different ways they saw the decline in terms of quality in terms of body size and antler development in white-tailed deer in south texas and he goes you know what what the world's going on here so they started delving into it and realized that hey maybe we're shooting them before they're too young maybe we're shooting too many we're not killing any does 
we had been in a state of in Texas of in the early years of having screwworm flies, which essentially, if a fawn wasn't born during a certain period of time, the screwworm fly, the larval stage of that is a flesh eating larval stage. And we lost a lot of fawns. When we finally got rid of the screwworm fly uh, by irra uh, irradiating hundreds of thousands of millions of flies and dropping them all over the state of Texas and elsewhere, even over the southeast, what we learned is earlier is that a female fly would only mate one time. Well, she made it with a sterile male. She wasn't going to produce any star, you know, produce star legs. If she produced eggs at all. When we finally got rid of the screwworm fly. That's when that deer population in Texas and some of the other parts of the southeast started picking up. And all of a sudden, we went from having very few deer to way too many deer. You know, that's a thing that I find. Uh, one of the things that I might find most fascinating is because that was your background. Um, you were a, a biologist, as you mentioned. A, a, uh, wildlife biologist, but you also did uh, veterinary pathology. And one thing that didn't screwworm infestations almost completely de decimate populations throughout the South? They uh, did. In, in certain areas, it was really, really bad. And, and you know, back then, it, interesting to a lot of things having to do with, with the rut. Years ago, if those ponds weren't born within about a two week period when those flies were not prevalent, they didn't survive. I mean, it just, as you said, almost wiped out the deer populations in certain areas uh, in terms of we had pronghorn antelope even in the lower, what we call the King Ranch country or the Wild Horse Desert, the very southern tip of Texas. And it was the screwworm flies that wiped out, essentially wiped out the pronghorn antelope. Wow. That particular subspecies there. So, but finally, thankfully to uh, our governor at the time, who was going to be uh, Dolph Briscoe, who was a huge rancher out of the Uvalde area, he and the, his partner, uh, Red Nunley, the, the cattle industry was devastated by all this too. I mean, those flies would infest into anything that was a mammal, quite frankly. And it really affected the cattle industry. So they were the ones who came up with this idea that, hey, the, the she'll mate one time she mates with a fly that a male fly that's sterile you know we, maybe we can control these and that's how we came about with the the wildlife thing was secondary to the cattle industry at that time yep. but all that changed very quickly as the number of deer increased and all of a sudden landowners realized there's an economic value in deer and uh once we got the numbers going up, things really changed as far as attitudes is concerned when you're dealing with white-tailed deer, habitat, and, and wildlife management as a whole. That's one thing Charlie always said, rest his soul, is he said once people realize the value of white-tailed deer, everything changes. And that it did. definitely it happened in Texas. Yes, sir, it did. It really, truly did. And, of course, like I said, we went from very few deer to – too many deer, and then it was a, a really a hard thing. I can remember when we first had our first antlerless deer, no seasons in Texas. It was like, oh my God, you're going to do what? You're going to ask us to shoot does? You know, they go, oh, we can't do that. My God, we're killing the cows. We're going to get rid of all of them. And I remember the first years in some of the what we call the rush country of South Texas. Uh, those first few years that we issued permits down there, we might have issued, say, 3,000, and maybe two of them got used. Oh my God. And they went from to a period of time where finally they figured out, well, several things happened. People start realizing, yeah, there is a problem. Secondarily, we had uh, people become a little bit more educated about deer as far as management is concerned. And then we pretty much also had a change of generations as far as landowners and hunters are concerned to all of a sudden we're open to new ideas. Okay, so Larry, your background, I could almost stay on this for the entire podcast. I promise I won't. Um, you went to Texas A&M. You got your degree as a wildlife biologist. You were working for the state. You were working for the, was it the Texas Parks and Wildlife? Is that was your, that was your first job when you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But when I, as an undergraduate, I went to work for the Wildlife Disease Project, which was an interagency contract between the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and the Department of Veterinary Pathology. And at that time, we had a wildlife disease project, and that wildlife disease project encompassed a, a statewide uh, 
serious look at what causes diseases and nutrition was a big part of that so that was one of the things we were involved in during those years that i was with the uh, under contract with the game department for about four or five years there doing the research we dealt with everything from alligators to working with desert bighorn sheep out in the western part of the state and of course pronghorn and uh just about every species that you can imagine including some of the snakes and and uh good gosh raccoons and possums and skunks dealing with the uh oh everything from distempered to uh, to rabies kind of thing deer talk now is brought to you by mossberg mossberg has been supplying american hunters with quality firearms for over a hundred years over the years they've upheld their commitment to innovation by creating a handful of firearms that have shaped the way we hunt today for more information, visit Mossberg.com. So how did you, um, there was a point when you were, I, I could talk about the disease factor because we, I want to get into chronic wasting disease, but let's table that for a second. There was at some point in your young career where a light bulb went off or something that you were working for the state, you probably had a pretty decent job. Um, then you went out into the private sector probably before anybody else. Well, maybe visibly before anybody else and you started working for basically you looked at it texas is 98 percent private land and you started working but not only working with private landowners but tell tell the listeners and viewers what you saw and how that all got started going back uh again i came along at the right time but I was the technical assistance biologist for South Texas, which rich, re, really kind of covered from uh, just south of Houston to San Antonio to, to about Del Rio, helping set up wildlife management programs, and which included doing helicopter surveys. I spent four or five months a year in a helicopter doing game surveys, flying over ranches to look at the population, but also look at the habitat, look at the grazing situation, looking at water. And I found out very quickly I could learn more about a ranch in a day out of a helicopter than I could months on the ground, even though we did some of the, the, the ground type stuff. So I, I, we were very successful in that. We established lots of management programs, open new programs and maintained several others. But uh, I, the reason I left the state more than anything else is because I had started writing and I really loved to write. And one day I got a call from, from the headquarters office in Austin. And I said, Larry, we've got absolutely fantastic news. We're going to move you to a new position in Austin at the headquarters. And I thought, so my response was, oh my God, thank you. I'm so honored. And I hung up the phone. I called my wife and I says, I'm quitting the state. And she says, you're going to do what? Because she knew all I'd ever talked about is being a wildlife biologist. And I said, well, I've been offered this, not really offered. I've been told I'm going to be moving up to Austin to for a new position. And I said, I don't really want to spend the rest of my career sitting behind a desk. And so I said, I think the best thing for me is just to try to leave at this point. I had just started writing then as well, too, in, in a serious manner. And and uh, so I'd, we, we set up our own little business on consulting, dealing with a lot of the ranchers that I'd met over the years and uh, who had wanted maybe a little bit more work than I could do as, as a state biologist because I couldn't really spend the time there. So basically that's where it came from. And the reason I left and stayed up my own business is because I was going to have to go to Austin and sit in the office and also wanted to write and they didn't want me to write. And so I said, okay, time for me to go somewhere else. Well, that, that was a great career move by, by your point. Um, a short sighted one on the state. Um, I've had this conversation over the years with John Ozoga. Uh, John, bless his heart. He's, he's still going up in Michigan, but he does not have a cell phone or email or isn't on the internet. So I can't, I can't talk to him unless I pick up the phone or write him a letter, but he Smart told man. me he had the same thing in Michigan. Um, yes, sir. at the time it was Michigan DNR. And, um, they basically said, you know, and he had to convince them like, well, this is actually beneficial for the state to popularize science. And that's where we came in. Uh, we, you know, we were deer and deer hunting was publishing your articles, John's articles. Yes, yes you glean that information in your state job, but you brought it to the masses. And that I could it always boggled my mind that why would somebody be holding you? Was there somebody in a corner office that was jealous that you might be making two hundred bucks off an article? What, what was the deal there? You know what? I'm not really sure what the case is. Is is over the years I've always had, had the position of. You know, we've got, there's so much great research out there, but at, at, 
for the longest period of time, it sat in some technical journal or sat in a, in a report that we did that sat in an office somewhere that never was spread to the people who could really utilize that information. So I'm not sure whether it was a, a, a jealousy thing. I know that there was some of that and it wasn't so much on a personal thing uh, as it was, I think the fact that I don't know if we want these people to know what they can do. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I find that very and there's, ridiculous. And there's state it, employees. And they're saying, <laughs> yes, and, and, and their salaries were being paid, of course, by by hunting licenses and the Pittman Robertson Act, you know, and, and uh, all those other kind of things. And yet they were anti putting out information. So, uh, but of course, thankfully, a lot of that has changed over the years now, too. But I, yes, I remember John very well. And I think I, if I recall, he and I had a very calm you know, similar conversations, what we're having about this right now, a bunch of years ago. Oh, I find it fascinating because the, the depth of the information, if it was a journal of wildlife management paper, I can read it and kind of understand what's going on, but I need one of you guys is like, okay, here, this is like the office, uh, Michael from the office. Tell to tell me that, that like I'm five, Ex- explain this to me like I'm five, because I know there's a lot going on in this article, but I can't understand the research. <laughs> I was very fortunate in that respect in that I worked with Dr. R.M. Robinson, who at the time was uh, the premier wildlife pathologist there was in the world. And, and he was one of those individuals who could take the most complicated disease process and sit down with somebody who had never gone to school and had no background of any kind of scientific things. And Dr. Robinson would sit there on a stump or on a fence post with a guy or a fence and, and tell him about this process, how this disease develops and everything that goes along with it. And he would do it in terms that anybody could understand. And I was very fortunate to have worked with him because that I learned so much from him about vision with people and, you know, again, showing people respect regardless of what the education level was. Because back when we started doing a lot of these things, we didn't have going to college was really something kind of unusual. And when you dealt with a landowner that had anything of a education much beyond high school and particularly probably didn't have any technical type of information dealing with, with wildlife or the range or, or cattle or, you know, anything like that, that gave me the opportunity to sit down and, and, and sit down and literally talk this process through and said, okay, you know, this is kind of, and, and always made it their idea. I learned a long time ago that if you can make something, somebody is their idea, take your, what you're feeling and make them feel like they're the one that came up with the idea to do this, they get it done. So I, I've told people this in the past. This is there are times that I spent three or four years with an old landowner who was a fantastic manager in his own kind of way. And just feed him little things and feed him little things, feed him little things. And then about, you know, about four or five years later, he calls you and goes, Larry, I've been thinking about this. He said, I think we ought to do this. And I go, oh, my God, what a fabulous idea. And you could see his chest swell out, you know, and everything that I wanted to get done got done. But it was his idea and his do it. <laughs> that's awesome. I, that's an awesome approach. So let's talk about, um, so over the years, I know you've, I, I, I saw this and I was looking under the DSC page. You have basically touched, helped manage over 12 million acres over the years of, yes, sir. of private land. And we, we would like to say, well, it's for deer, but it's for deer. It's for, it's whitetails, mule deer, antelope, sheep, elk. And the, the, the overriding premise under everything that you've done, and I know Bob Zaglin has done, and other uh, managers down there have done, is you're going after the habitat. Yeah, you're managing it for deer, but you're also managing it for songbirds and uh, and, and small game and things like that. How ha- how did you? I guess who helped you with that? How did you get going, and how did it become successful? Because it seems like an almost an enormous overtaking. I think it goes back to a lot of things to where we'd go in and just do kind of a baseline thing of what kind of vegetation was there and what kind of birds were there, uh, what kind of small animals were there. 
and then setting up a management program and all of a sudden realizing where the landowner, you'd be out there and you're seeing songbirds and hearing game birds that you've not heard on that property before. You're seeing butterflies that you've not seen there before. The, uh, the, all of a sudden the water that was always muddy and, and very limited, now there's more water. And so it was just kind of a progression of things of just actually seeing this happen and go, wait a minute, we did this for whitetail deer, but now we've got all this great variety of songbirds. We've got, now we've got squirrels, we've got rabbits, we've got, we've got snakes that we hadn't seen before, both good and bad in some instances, but, you know, and, and, but pretty much is just, and you saw insects that were so important for quail and for turkeys and other birds that are out there as well too. So it was really just initially watching this happen and, uh, and then realizing what, the reason why is because we improved the habitat primarily for whether it was white-tailed deer, whether it was mule deer, whether it was pronghorn antelope, whether it was waterfowl or, or turkeys or quail. You just saw this progression of improved habitat and variety in terms of speciation of vegetation, which resulted in variety in the speciation of the animals that were there. So it was it was that kind of thing. And then we learned how to take advantage of it. Years ago, I, I dealt with a lot of different ranchers down south in South Texas who had really nice lodges. Uh, and those lodges were vacant pretty much five months, uh, I mean, all but about four or five months out of the year. And so we started talking to different people and birding was starting to become a little bit more popular. And we had this huge complex of, of people in the San Antonio and Houston area. And so I found out there were some birding clubs. So I went to those birding clubs and I said, Hey, I said, if we can find a place for you guys to go birding in some of these ranches in South Texas, would y'all be interested? I said, absolutely. So I went back to the rancher and I said, look, you got this beautiful camp sitting out here. Let's consider getting in touch with some of these birding groups let's do a let them bring the bus on or let them do a tour and we'll set them around water hold we'll feed them a meal you'll charge them two hundred dollars for being there and i said you'll make some money and your lodge will be utilized and i said oh by the way when we do that we'll have this opportunity to talk to them and say you know the reason we've got these great number and variety of, of species here now that we didn't have before is because we manage for white-tailed deer which involves hunting and hunting pays for the conservation not only of the white-tailed deer but of the habitat and the improvement of the habitat and therefore now guess what we have all these birds that we didn't have before so it gave us an avenue also to bring into the fold if you will a lot of people here with the Audubon society all of a sudden we're not that adamantly opposed to white-tailed deer hunting or quail hunting or turkey hunting and they saw the value of having hunting because of the bird species that that all of a sudden showed up in this improved habitat this is awesome stuff i hope everybody's listening to this because this is how it all started i'm not giving all the credit to larry but larry was one of those guys on the front lines that you had that vision that leopold landscape vision of if you build it, they will come. And by the way, that idea with the, the landowners is brilliant. That was VRBO like 40 years ahead of its time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you had to learn to be innovative kind of thing at times. Uh, I was so very fortunate over the years. I dealt with so many different people in, in terms of landowners and hunting groups. And I always tried to glean a little something from every one of them that, that I met. Uh, at the time, too, I was, I was writing a bunch of columns for a uh, Southern Livestock Standard, which was a weekly uh, livestock publication. And I wrote a column there called A View from the Pear Flat. Pear Flat being prickly pear flat, not mm -hmm. pear tree kind of thing. And in the course of that, they pretty much let me do what I wanted to. So I was able to develop several characters, if you will, and stories. But I could always figure out a way to add something about wildlife, a little bit about wildlife management into what I was talking about, even though uh, maybe the people didn't even realize it until later. I, I've often told people too, I said in more recent years, I've made a living teaching people what they already knew. You know, they, they'd read about it, but I'm talking about wildlife management mm -hmm. or livestock or habitat management, but by telling the story or, 
or somehow or another getting them to relate what needed to be done or should be done. Uh, and they already knew about it. They just didn't know how to implement it. And they hadn't really thought about it. So you, again, it was making it more their idea than my idea kind of thing. So where do we sit today? Um, <clears throat> state of the white tail deer in America. Uh, let's just say 2023 versus 1980. Uh, what, what's the difference and where are we headed? I think the, a big difference is, is that we have people so much more aware of what we did a few years ago in terms of requirements of, of uh, habitat and, and nutrition and the importance of age. And it, we've seen a tremendous change over the years, maybe it's due to quality deer management in a way, the, the concept, and to some extent, the organization as well, too. But today, the people are much talking about the people as a whole in terms of landowners, in terms of, uh, particularly probably in terms of landowners, because where we have huge amounts of private land these days, most land that's being su- bought or sold, whichever case is, is for recreational purposes kind of thing. So people become a lot more aware of things. Here in Texas, back in 1985, two other guys and I, uh, Gary Machen and Murphy Ray and I started the Texas Wildlife Association, which now is an unbelievable organization that does tremendous amount of of, uh, of uh, education, if you will, in schools and in, in front of groups and all those kind of things, a big part of it. So we, we've seen that change happen, you know, over the last several years. We're at probably as good a point as we've ever been in terms of education. Uh, there, there certainly are... are obstacles that we're going to be facing in the future habitat is one of them in that so many areas i'm right now in a little town called Mithlothian, south of dallas and i can remember flying over this country years ago before we had land satellites our satellite mapping thing with a county map and drawing in where the houses were and, and now if i were to do that if you look at it this dallas fort worth area is one huge 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 complex where there used to be these little towns so we're losing habitat which simply means that we have to more wisely manage the habitat that's left and then you know, we've got things to look down the road that we have to really probably deal with like cwd and a few other things as well too but uh to me, we're living at the, at the very finest of whitetail deer hunting that we probably ever have. I agree. I agree with that on that. Let, let's talk about CWD. Um, where do we sit? Uh, what, I know Texas is experiencing uh, more, more findings of it, I guess you would say. Um, right. Is our, let's talk about the disease because you are a disease expert. I, I, I want to get it from you direct without prefacing it all. Um, how is CWD affecting us? <laughs> CWD is affecting us probably both in terms of uh, white-tailed deer populations and also in terms of human thought as much as anything. Uh, I've been away from the wildlife disease thing for the last several years now, so I, I'm aware of, of, you know, it's it's being a prion and all those kind of things. And literally it can't be supposedly killed by uh, uh, hardly anything. Although back when I asked the current veterinarians what they were using, if they were necropsying an animal, what did they do to sterilize their, uh, their instruments so that they didn't spread it? And they go, common bleach. He said, common bleach kills it. And I go, wait a minute. What, 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 what did you say? (laughs) He said, well, common bleach will destroy it. And I said, okay, so we know, we know that kind of thing. Of course, now with there's a tremendous amount of things that's been going on with the deer breeding program, and, and I just left a uh, meeting of our TWA uh, Texas Wildlife Association uh, Big Game Committee uh, about a day or so ago, and I know that right now there's a, a, some research being done by some of the breeders dealing with genotypes to determine if there is a particular genotype that is maybe not immune to it but more resistant to it. With my theory in all this is, is CWD has probably been around for a long, long time. It's it started cropping up more recently. I think we made a mistake in some of the states and some of the provinces where we went in and wholesale killed animals to reduce that population. There is such a thing as if you look at, at being back a background from wildlife diseases, uh, there's really no disease that's ever wiped out an entire population. There have been underlying underlying things there and mother nature for some reason or another seems to have always put 
some individuals within that population that is maybe immune or certainly more resistant to certain things. So to me, sometimes it's better to kind of let things kind of run its course. But like we're dealing with here in Texas, we had very recently, very close to the little town I live, about halfway between Austin and Houston, we had a couple of different CWD cases showed up in breeding operations. Well, to me, my position in all this is, is there's a push right now to limit the movement of any kind of deer, live deer. And I think that's going to have to play into this. There's no reason we're going to get some natural movement anyway. We're not too sure yet exactly what all can carry it from one place to the next, but there's no question that if you put a deer on a trailer and release it somewhere else that has CWD within its system, and it's a slow developing disease, if you will. So even though you may test negative on an animal three years later, that same animal, even if he's by himself without anything else around, could test positive. So to me, it's time that we, we need to restrict the movement as much as we can, particularly of live deer. So restricting movement, um, a big one is what you're saying. The other one is um, one thing that I've seen is just this it's almost like a groundhog day kind of thing with states testing and testing and <laughs> testing and testing and testing. Yep. Right. It's over here. Yep. It's over here. What are your thoughts on, uh, uh testing and also should, or I should say, what, what should we be doing to advance our knowledge of the disease to the next level? You know, recently I think there was a bill passed that had set up a tremendous amount of dollars to to really get into the research sort of thing. And so I think we're on the cusp of looking into some really serious research. And and maybe that will include looking at genotypes as well, too, to determine whether there is a particular genotype in a white-tailed deer that will stave this disease or, or keep it away. Or maybe there's an immunity or maybe there's a resistance kind of thing. Uh, but again, it comes back down to it. I think we need to, until we can get some of this research going and really get something that's really strong. I mean, there've been some people that said, well, if you add this to the deer's diet, it reduces this. There, there's really no real sound research yet that I've found that I can, from, with my background, look at and go, okay, this is definitive. You know, there, there's still a lot of theory out there kind of thing. Uh, so I think, looking forward we, going back we just need to restrict movement as much as we can on any kind of live deer uh we need to probably take a serious look at you know right now in crossing into state lines uh hunting out of state the first thing i do if i'm going to go out of state is i call that game department where i'm going the game department where i'm traveling through it's okay what are your restrictions as far as bringing animals through this area and there i'm talking about skulls and capes and those kind of things too you also you touched on it um, as far as the, the mass efforts when CWD was first found, especially you know east of the Mississippi. What are your thoughts on eradication programs? Because I know they're happening right now in your state. Well, the eradication program that's going on is strictly is a possibility within a breeding herd. It's not outside of that breeding area kind of thing. So uh, you got to do something with the animals. At, at this point, there is no sign of any kind that uh, it may be transmissible to humans and because if you look back you know it really kind of described primarily up in that northeast corner of colorado with the elk kind of thing and to me that's where it started out being discovered if you will well if you looked at it there in that instance if you looked at uh, all the guys who were guides who were meat cutters who are taxidermists there's never been any kind of problem with any of those guys those were the guys dealing spinal columns are dealing with spinal fluid they're dealing with lymph nodes and all those kind of things so uh, uh I, it's not a human problem at this time that's not to say that sometime in the future things could not go that way but i don't think that's going to happen based on what we've seen so far on the eradication program is to me outside of in a, in a wild situation uh I, I don't think we need to go in and totally eradicate that's not going to, that's not going to accomplish anything. It goes back to that thing of, yeah, maybe mother nature put some animals in here that are resistant to it, that are immune. And sometimes you got to let things kind of run through that cycle. If you will, the eradication that's going on here in Texas is only if 
that herd has been tested positive and they have, there's really no place to take them. So, uh, so in some instances that may be the result of what happens is that those animals have to be, uh, uh, put, put down. Okay, great. I didn't want to talk too much about that, but I very much appreciate your insights on that. I'm sure the, the listeners and viewers do too. This episode is also brought to you by Game Hide. At Game Hide, the philosophy is pretty simple. Design the best products with the best fabrics and features to help you be more successful in the field. While doing this, they strive to keep their pricing moderate to give you the best value in the hunting clothing industry. I wear the Elimitic line of clothing to keep those nasty ticks off of me, and I absolutely love it. Check them out at GameHide.com. We're going to flip the the subject a little bit, get it a little bit lighter. So Larry was a a biologist. He did all this research. He worked for the state. He started his own private um, consulting business, did that for many years. Then, boom, you hit it big, and you were basically an instant movie star. (laughs) Um, We (laughs) we saw you all over the place. You were over with my friends over at North American Hunting Club um, on their TV show, many, many, many TV shows. Uh, numerous tele awards nominated for several Emmys. How did you go from this researcher <laughs> kind of educational guy to now you're the guy on TV, Mr. Whitetail? The, the the Mr. Whitetail thing is a result of Jay Wayne Fears, who has been a writer for a long, long time. And I know you know Jay Wayne as well, too. Years ago, we were both writing for Harris Publications, and he called me one day and he said, uh, uh, let's, uh, he said, I want to do some stuff about you. And I said, okay. And so next thing I know, I show up on the cover and I'm being called Mr. Whitetail kind of thing. So well, is that how that started? That's how it all started. It's all fears as fault. <laughs> <laughs> so he hung this moniker on you and you've had to live with it ever since. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I, I, I kind of giggle about it at times, but you know, it, it's off. I'm also honored by the, by the title, if you will, kind of thing. So, um, uh, where, where it all, all that started, it, the first TV show I did goes back a long time ago. There was a guy named Larry Godfrey who worked for TAMU, which was the Texas A&M University's TV channel. And uh, he, I did a hunt with him. And so uh, that was the first TV show I did. But having spent time with Dr. Mick Robinson, Dr. R.M. Robinson, I had the opportunity quite often to go in front of groups to uh, discuss things that were going on back then, uh, as it is now, EHD was a big problem or blue tongue. And, and, but the biggest problem that we had in a lot of instances across the nation, as far as white tailed deer are concerned, was hollow belly, just not enough nutrition. Well, that gave me the opportunity to get in front of a lot of people to do some talking. And so when, uh, all this TV stuff started and, uh, I got serious about it with, with, uh, real trade with Bill Jordan and, and uh, then, of course, with Bass Pro as well, too. I was on the Redhead Pro hunting team there for a long time. But, but I was always one of these guys that it really did not bother me to get up in front of a group to speak to a group, no matter whether it's three people or, or 300 people kind of thing. And so because of my background as a wildlife biologist and the research that we've done, particularly in those early years with white-tailed deer dealing with antler development, nutrition disease, all those other kind of things, uh, I was called upon a lot. And so that gave me the opportunity to get in front of people to, to talk to them about what's going on as far as white tailed deer is concerned and, and what some of the concerns were and how some of those concerns could be met, you know, try to change some of those things. So it was just kind of a natural progression of things. I never dreamed about being in front of TV. I mean, I, I, I loved writing. I love reading. I love the outdoors and I wanted to hunt. And I loved hunting and I loved the people who I spent time with at hunting camps kind of thing. So just kind of slow, nice progression. The next thing I know, I was kind of pushed a little bit more, pushed a little bit more. And then I was doing TV shows as a, as a guest and a, a lot, a lot. And finally figured out, you know, what, 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 how would I have done this show had I been doing it? So I started my own show a long, long time ago. And that kind of led to other things and other things to the point now to where, uh, I gave my show the Trail of the Hunter's Moon, which is the last one I did, which is based on a book I did for Stoger back in 2004 to Blake Barnett. And Blake's taking it from there. But now I'm working with uh, 
with Brandon Houston with a new digital TV show called The Journey, which The Journey kind of describes it itself. And we're going to look into some of the things that we're talking about here, both in his career and my career as well, too. So just kind of progression of things. The other thing was, is I was writing a lot and I started seeing that some of our advertising dollars were being siphoned off by TV. And I thought, well, you know, if we're going to try to keep this dollar thing going, maybe we need to be doing some TV. So then we got into the TV thing and then, then the podcast thing came along and then digital TV is everybody now has some kind of device that they can watch a show on digitally that, uh, so it's just been kind of a progression and not staying in front of that curve, but I want to stay just, just a few steps behind that. You, curve. You've been in front really of it. Forward. You and Jim Shockey. Cause I remember Jim was writing those back page stories for us. Uh, oh back yeah. In the day. <laughs> 250 bucks a crack. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> you and Jim both, uh, you, you took to the TV thing. The other thing that I f- find very just heartwarming is that you not only got into the television, but you 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 got back to enjoying hunting yourself and then this kind of morphed into now you're hunting the world and then the other thing that you talk i'll let you talk about that but uh the the whole campfire thing is because you and i shared that camp in texas at the nail ranch and i think it was i looked it up it was 1997 but uh, i could tell that you really reveled in camp life and enjoying who's all there and the whole experience. So tell the listeners and the viewers a little bit about when you started broadening, because I know you've hunted everything and you did it with a handgun for a long time. I I, I did. The campfire thing goes back to my youth, if you will. I can remember sitting around a campfire with my granddad and my dad and my uncles, particularly during the hunting season. My dad ran hounds and all that kind of thing for coons and foxes. And, and so there was a lot of campfire time. And so I really got to appreciate the stories that people told, uh, J Frank Doby, who's the poet laureate of Texas once said, and I sat down in front of the greatest philosopher in the world, the fire. There's something about a campfire that brings out all the good things of people as far as I'm concerned. So that's where the campfire thing got started. And then I've tried to use that kind of as a basis for a lot of things that we've done over the last several years as well, too. The hunting of the world thing came about in that, uh, first TV show I had that was my own was called hunting the world. And it was on the outdoor channel years ago now, long time ago. And, uh, I'd, I'd read as a child when I, before I could read, my mom would read to me from the pages of outdoor life and sports and field. And, and that was back when adventure type things were, were absolutely huge. And so I think that instilled it within me, the desire to someday, you know, I wanted to go to Alaska. I wanted to go to Canada, you know, dared dared to dream about even Africa or Europe or some or Australia or New Zealand or, you know, any of the other places. And, uh, but the more that I, I got into that sort of thing, the, the more I enjoyed it, never forgetting white tail deer. I, there were some things I would not, I would not go away from white tail deer in November and December down here, regardless of the, it may, I may go to Canada to hunt, but I wasn't about to go hunt anywhere else in the world when white tail deer season was going on, but it was an interest in the cultures that you hunted in. It was an interest in trying to look at the different habitats is an interest in learning more about the animals in different parts of the world. It was learning how all those animals interrelated, such as in, you look at Africa and you've got everything from a giraffe and elephant down to, you know, little, little bitty things that are the size of jackrabbits, you know, how do all these critters survive and, and what's in relationship with them as far as habitat is concerned. And then it was just the the stories that people would tell about their hunting experiences and some of the adventures that they had that I think just kind of continually drew me more and more to, uh, to want to do those things, to, to hunt the world. So tell me, uh, one story we're sitting at the campfire right now. Um, of all these years, you're going back 30 plus years of uh, what was like, maybe what was one of the more dicey hunts you've been on over the years? (laughs) <laughs> uh, there, there, there have been several. I've been charged numerous times by by black bear over the years. Uh, in in Alaska, sticking my head out of the tent, and all, 
all of a sudden here comes a black bear at full charge kind of thing. One of the, the more adventuresome things was, though, is, is I've been very fortunate. I've hunted grizzly a couple of times or three times in Alaska and been successful generally in the last 30 minutes of the hunt, regardless of length of the hunt. And it goes back to uh, Blake Barnett filming the show for me. And we wanted to get in this one canyon, couldn't get there. The wind was the wrong way. The last afternoon, finally, Ray came and we could we took off at a dead run to this canyon and uh, got into this barely got into it and here's this really nice bear and and i thought he was actually going to charge and he did not uh but i i shot him for actually before he had a chance to i guess when he got right down to it we get the bear down get all the footage we need get the photographs now it's getting dark and the all of a sudden the guy goes he said, my god he says i didn't bring a flashlight and i said neither did i and he says well i'll tell you what he says the camp's two miles back i'll run to camp get a flashlight because it'll be dark before we get out here i said no problem i said i'll have the bear skin by the time you get back so I get down there skinning the bear and I'm, and I'm skinning the bear and I have to kind of look up and about, no, oh, 50, 60 yards away, here comes this big bear. And he is, you can tell he's swaggering back and forth, you know, and he's coming to us. Now, now the wind has changed. He can smell the blood. He can smell the humans. And so, uh, I'm going, oh my God, you know, see what he's going to do. So I gave Blake my, my 375 Ruger. And I said, he said, you want me to kill the bear if it gets close? I said, no, you can't kill him unless he bites me. I said, he's literally got to bite me. We don't have a permit. You know, we don't have a license. So this bear keeps coming closer. He said, what am, what am I, what am I going to do? And I said, well, I said, if he comes, try to shoot right in front of him and blow some gravel in, in his face kind of thing. And hopefully it'll stop him. And the bear keeps coming. And I, I said, Blake, just get ready just in case. And so I stood up and screamed at the very top of my voice using a couple of extra particular expletive <laughs> that might be descriptive of that particular bear <laughs> and, and here he comes he comes at a full charge and blake shoots right in front of him probably at about 20 steps away and the bear literally came to a, a halt like a really nice fine four horse rated horse sliding down on his hind feet and stops right there and he'd look at me he'd stare at me and he'd look away and he'd stare at me and he'd pop his teeth and i thought oh my god because all i've got and then I, and the re really bad part about it was that was the last show we had with us. <laughs> so here I am with a knife in my hand and this bear keep looking, he'd turn away and he'd look and he'd pop his teeth and he'd make all kinds of noise. And I thought, yeah, this is really going to get serious. Wasn't till after the bear finally turned around and walked away that Blake looks, opens a the gun. There are no more shells in it. <laughs> oh my gosh. So that was one of those times when, you know, it, it was exciting up to that point. And you thought, well, you know, this is, maybe this is how it ends. You know, maybe I'll, I'll be, you know, I've always loved bear and I'll, you know, it's kind of like the guy that years ago, they got eaten by the bear. He always wanted to be one with the bear. He was one with the bear for a short period of time, whatever the digestive system was where he left it kind of thing. And I really kind of thought that might've been it, but, you know, we've been chased by things and, in in africa and all those kind of things but that's one of those particular north american memories that will always stick with me that is crazy and i can imagine you probably excuse me <clears throat> probably had a lot more of those larry i would love to keep going on but we can't um i want to tell everybody dsc is dallas safari clubs um campfires with larry wysoon podcast that's the thing you've been doing right now mostly or and i know you've got a lot of irons in the fire doing other things as well well, right now, too, as I mentioned, we're doing the journey, which is on Carbon TV as well. Just started there. Uh, <clears throat> the the podcast can be heard there, too. It's DSC Campfires. It can be heard on iHeart. It, uh, it's distributed to uh, Waypoint TV and Gen 7 Outdoors and in and, and a lot of different places. So there's a lot of opportunities there. I also do a, a weekly podcast with, a, with a, not a competing magazine, but another magazine uh, with Sporting Classics. We have a weekly podcast there as well, too called campfires with luke and larry and it's available on uh, uh sporting classics daily so those and i do a lot of things with dallas Safari club with our different chapters there's some, there's so many gr really good organizations out there uh, when it comes to co-op conservation but uh dsc in, in my estimation stands out above the rest because they do it for all the right reasons and a lot of things they do, they don't get credit for, and they don't really care where they get credit for. They get what they care about is that it gets done. And, and, uh, if people like to learn a little bit more there, they can go to B I G G A M E dot O R G that's big And, uh, and then of course they can get in touch with me through a lot of different sources, either at, uh, at Larry Weissen on Instagram or 
at Larry Weissman on Facebook and, and, uh, they can go to the, the, another website is, uh, H three whitetail solutions, H is the letter three whitetail solutions.com. And they can get in touch with me there as well too. I suggest you guys do that because I actually, I had a whole nother list of questions for you from the whitetail solutions. It's H H C H three H three whitetail solutions. Yeah. It's awesome guys. You've got to check this out. Basically, there was I had an entire list about food plots and habitat management. Um, I wanted to ask you about Austrian winter peas. Can't do that this podcast, but you guys can actually read their con- their their. Uh, uh, they basically take your questions and answer them. It's it's awesome stuff. So uh, be f- sure to check that out, Larry. So good to see you, my friend, and we really want to thank you for taking the time out to speak with us today. Dan, I am truly honored to be with you, and I can't wait to truly spend another campfire session with you. Maybe the next time it won't rain quite as hard as Yes, he remembers. Oh. He totally remembers it. He totally remembers that story. I remember, I remember Dan Schmidt walking in with a turkey that looked like a buzzard because the feathers were so wet. <laughs> of course, you were living on the wet side. And too. you guys are giggling in the truck, dry with coffee. Yeah, it was awesome. But of course. <laughs> it was awesome. It was my first and only turkey with a muzzle-only shotgun, too, by the way. Really? Yes, I'll it was. Yep, that was pretty It awesome. was a memorable one. Uh, and awesome. this is big, too, Dan. I really, truly appreciate being with you this morning or this afternoon or whatever it turns out. Whenever to anybody's you. listening to this is Thank when we Thank you so play. very much. That's right. Thank you, Larry. For Larry Wysoon, boy, this has been a great honor. Be sure to check out those pages. Go to uh, Facebook, Instagram, or the websites we mentioned there. We'll put them in the comments for you. And until next week, again, every Thursday, we drop a new episode of Deer Talk Now. We appreciate you watching and uh, listening. And also, please, all we ask you to do is like and subscribe. That's all we ask you to do on these pages. We'll catch you next week for another episode of Deer Talk Now. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you or log on to 10pointcrossbows.com for more information.